So given that it's an intimate group, uh, what I will do with you is I'll share with you some personal experiences that have shaped my thinking in the last <coughs> few years, and from that uh, we'll take it from there. So uh, I grew up in what is traditionally called labor Zionism, uh, the left wing of Israeli politics. Um, certainly when I grew up uh, in the 80s, uh, I was a big believer in a two-state solution, in peace, uh, very much opposing the settlement project. And I truly believe that the day that the Palestinians would have a state in the West Bank and Gaza is the day we would have peace. Uh, the 90s were a time of euphoria for me. I believed that peace was at hand, uh, that we were getting there. And, uh, and really there was a sense that we're going to be, it's going to happen. And, um, and then the last 15 years have been very difficult. They've been difficult not just for me, they've been very difficult for people like me who share my, my thinking. Uh, and the reason is that what characterized the last 15 years, the reason I speak about 15 years is I start counting from 2000. 2000 is when that was kind of the culmination of the 90s, the two sides going to negotiate peace and Camp David, and then it all came crashing down. And I kind of, it started in 2000, but then there were other opportunities in 2006 and 8, recently in 14. And I remember thinking that I was left wondering, how is it that the Palestinians, when faced with a real opportunity to have a state, not perfect, not everything, but a state, dignity, liberty, freedom, uh, they're unable to utter the word yes. And that got me questioning. And then what happened is after the breakdown of the talks, it descended into this bloody mayhem, which was called the Second Intifada, but it shares nothing with the first. Uh, you remember that time, I'm sure, of us as being blown up in our streets, uh, in, uh, cafes. And these were in cities like Haifa and Tel Aviv and Be'er Sheva, supposedly nothing controversial. And I remember thinking at that time, it was a very dark time in Israel. I literally remember feeling that if my car got stuck behind a bus, uh, you know, I would pray that the bus would not blow up because then, you know, that would be the end of me too. And it was a very dark time. You almost, there was nowhere safe. And I remember thinking at that time, I literally wanted to find a Palestinian person, kind of hold him by the shoulders and, and change, say, please tell me what you want. Tell me what you want. because. If you want to stay for yourself, I'm with you. I will fight with you shoulder to shoulder. But if more than you want to stay for yourself, you cannot come to terms with the fact that the price of having that state is me having my own, that the Jewish people will have their own state, will have their right to self-determination in this land. If this is something that you cannot accept, then I will fight you. If you're ch asking me to choose between you and me, then I choose me. And I have no more moral qualms about choosing us. And, but the thing that really got me thinking during that time is that I was invited to meet uh, young, moderate Palestinian leaders. I was a member of the Labor Party. I was considered a young Israeli moderate leader. And I was asked to meet, uh, to go to these meetings. And in these meetings, I realized that my counterparts were moderate in the sense that they accepted reality. They said things like, we get it. You're here. You're powerful. Um, someone even told me, uh, you were born here, so we will not send you away. And I remember thinking, thank you very much. And, um, and I realized, OK, they, they, re they accept reality. They recognize reality. And then we would have these post-dinner conversations. And they would say things like, the Jewish people are not a people. You're only a religion. And let me share with you, I'm an atheist. Many Jews are atheists. Uh, atheism has a strong and proud Jewish uh, tradition. Um, as Noah here likes to say, if you want to understand the Jewish relationship to faith, you need to understand that in Judaism you can believe in one God or less. So, um, so the people who built this country were atheists and were secular and still a very strong strain uh, in Jewish civilization and culture. And when people say the Jewish people are only religion, I find it a very offensive idea. 
it's uh, something that is in the PLO charter and is very much in the Palestinian view that the Jewish people are only a religion and their home is, you know, Russia. But um, it excludes a huge share of the Jewish people. It excludes me, and I find it a very offensive notion. So they would say things like the Jewish people are not a people. You're only a religion. Uh, the religion is a subset of the people. If I'm committed to anything, it is to my people, not to the religion. Uh, they would say, um, your whole connection to this land is made up. It's a fabricated story that you created in order to take our lands. And, and I'm thinking, the connection between the Jewish people and Israel, if there's anything better documented, more well known, it's not just about religious texts. It's about it, people who have maintained that connection for centuries. Uh, I'm sure some of you had a chance to participate in a Passover Seder over the years. Um, I don't know if you remember what you say at the end of a Passover Seder. You say, next year in Jerusalem. Now, Jews said that for centuries, whether they lived in Poland or Morocco. Uh, the whole idea of Judaism as a religion was to preserve the connection to the land for the moment when the return to the land will be possible. I mean, if there's any uh, land to which the Jewish people are connected, and also from where they're from, where they were shaped as a people, their culture, their civilization, their traditions, uh, it is from here. So the notion that this is somehow fabricated and fabricated for the sole purpose of taking Palestinian land, uh, again, was something that I found deeply offensive. And, and the outcome was, of course, therefore, you have no rights here, you have no right to be here. You're here, you did it by force, but, and we recognize it, but it's nothing real. And I remember going back from those meetings deeply troubled and thinking, these are the moderates. So if these are the moderates, then the conflict between us is about far more than I was led to believe that it is about stopping settlement building or ending the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza. I, I thought, there's no symmetry here. I'm considered a moderate leader in the sense that I recognize the right of the Arab people between the Jordan and the Mediterranean to self-determination in this land. I recognize their right for a state. They recognize a connection to the land. I recognize that, and this is why I support two states. I realize they do not recognize my right. They recognize my might. But what happens the day that I no longer have might? They're merely reinforcing the notion that I have to continue to have might to survive here because there's no acceptance that I am here by right, that the Jewish people are indigenous to this land, that they're connected to it, that they are here by right, not by might. And I realize there's no symmetry here. Their moderation is an acknowledgment of a reality, which maybe they will hope to change uh, if Israel grows weak, uh, but my recognition of them is genuine. It's, it's about their right to self-determination in this land. And I went back from these meetings uh, deeply troubled and it really affected my thinking combined with all the other things I described. And then about a couple years ago I got an email from the organizer of the meetings. And uh, she told me, uh, she, the email said, uh, one of our funders of the meetings would like to know if these meetings had any impact on Ingram. And I wrote back to her. I said they had a tremendous impact on my thinking. I'm not sure if the funder will be happy to know uh, in which direction. And she asked me what happened, and I shared uh, this experience with her. And she wrote back to me. She said, well, you're absolutely wrong. There are many people who share your views. I was like, one would be wonderful, please. I've been searching for a while now. I've been speaking around the world. I have found no one that is willing to recognize the right of the Jewish people to self-determination in their land. I'm not saying a superior right. I'm not saying an exclusive right, but a right. Um, so she said, no, there's many people. I was like, fine, send me. So she started sending me emails from the participants in the program. And the email said things like, I yearn for the day when we will have peace between uh, Israel and Palestine, with its capital and East Jerusalem. And I was like, no, not good enough anymore. I've, I've heard the tone, I've heard the music. Uh, this is not good enough anymore. So she was, okay, tell me what would be good enough. What do you want to hear that will tell you that you have partners on the other side? 
Uh, so I penned the following paragraph. It said the following. It said, uh, the Jewish people around the world and the Arab Palestinians around the world are both indigenous to the land of Israel slash Palestine. Both have the right to return and settle anywhere in the land. But given the fact that these are two different peoples, different nations, different histories, different sense of self, religions, uh, they agree that for the sake of peace, they will divide the land between a Jewish state, Israel, and an Arab state, Palestine. And both uh, states will not be exclusive for their own people and will accommodate minorities of the other people. That was basically what I wrote. And I sent it to her and I said, that would be good enough. That is a mutual and equal recognition of the connection of both sides to the land. And then she disappeared. And I didn't hear a response, and I was very disappointed. And I wrote a piece, I wrote a piece detailing kind of this process in my thinking and how it shaped me. And I sent it to her and I said, look, I'm about to publish it. Uh, is there really no one? And at the very last minute she sent me someone who said, yes. And I was like, really? At this point I was growing, of course, very suspicious. Uh, I met him at the King David Hotel. Uh, we sat, we spoke, and I realized he was genuine. He generally spoke about uh, the fact that the Palestinians were wrong to reject the partition uh, recommendation of 1947, that the Jewish people are connected to this land, that we need to make peace based on this recognition. Uh, and it was wonderful. So I was able to publish this piece, and it got this title, Israeli Leftist Finds Glimmer of Hope. Uh, you can find it easily to Google. And I can tell you something about him. His name is Professor Dejani. And you might have heard about him recently because he's, uh, he was, and was as important here, he was the head of the American Studies Department in Al-Quds University, uh, a Palestinian university in East Jerusalem. And he lost his job over the fact that he recently took his students to an educational tour of Auschwitz. So it already gives you a sense that he's a very unique and courageous person. He comes from one of the oldest families, and I think that gives him a bit of that uh, uh, background and kind of standing. But the thing is this, for him to have his views, he needs tremendous courage. For me to have my views, I don't need courage. A large share of the Israeli public supports them. Uh, but in that, and in that sense, there's still no symmetry. A large share of the Israeli public accepts, supports the right of the Arab Palestinians to self-determination in this land and to their own state. And for an Arab Palestinian to recognize the right of the Jewish people to self-determination in this land, uh, he needs to be truly unique uh, and courageous. And the reason that I mention him is, um, in addition to the story, is that he also got me thinking on all of these movements to boycott, to isolate Israel. One of the first uh, organizations, academic organizations, to boycott Israel was the American Studies Association. He was the head of the American Studies Department in al Quds University. And yet the American Studies Association had zero to say about the fact that he lost his job as head of the American Studies Department in his university over the fact that he took his students to an educational tour of Auschwitz. And this has really led me to truly see the hypocrisy in all these claims because boycotting Israel, but then having nothing to say about the head of the American Studies Department losing his job and his role over teaching Palestinian students the Holocaust, well, I cannot imagine greater hypocrisy. And, and that's the thing that concerns me ultimately, that there's a lot of people who go, of goodwill that get roped into a lot of these movements the boycott, the solidarity, the justice for Palestine. But they never, and they, and they think that by doing so they're promoting peace. Um, I want peace, who doesn't? But the people who are leading these movements, they don't want peace the way I describe it. They don't want peace in the sense of accepting the right of the Jewish people and the Arab Palestinians equally to this land. They believe that the Jewish people here are foreigners, interlopers, 
that they have taken foreign land, that they're colonialists, which means that with enough resistance and force and violence, they can be made to go away. Um, and that is not a very peaceful notion. Uh, and a lot of people of goodwill who want peace get roped in into these things. They go into an organization that is called Justice for Palestine. And who doesn't want justice for Palestine? I want justice for Palestine. Until you understand that the injustice that needs to be corrected is the very existence of the State of Israel. <coughs> the very existence of the right to self-determination of the Jewish people in this land. This is the injustice that needs to be corrected. And therefore, justice for Palestine means superseding the, the State of Israel, erasing the State of Israel. Again, not a very peaceful notion. So um, this is why, despite the fact that I continue to be very much a supporter of peace and of two states, I have become uh, someone who these days campaigns for equal recognition of rights and asking that anyone who claims that they are acting for peace in a way demonstrate their credentials by supporting the equal rights of both peoples to the land and not privileging one people over another.